the chief restraints in modern cryptography, University of Trento, May 2022. Lecture one. This lecture is Introduction to the Chief Restraints in Modern Cryptography by Max Sala and Marco Calderini of the University of Trento. We'll give an introduction to the course and to cryptography. Historically, cryptography was the science and art of concealing the content of information. Nowadays, it's used and encompasses many other applications, including identity verification and advanced information sharing. The Componenti Cifris is our national initiative that gathers most Italian cryptographers. Several research trends have recently emerged, among which we cite post-quantum cryptography, cloud encryption, secure multi-party computation. This is the first lecture of our course, Trends in Modern Cryptography, where we'll have a look at these three themes. Post-quantum cryptography. Quantum computers are more and more efficient and may become a threat for the security of cryptographic primitives. In particular, Shor's algorithm, 1994, could be used to break traditional public key cryptography schemes, such as the RSA scheme, the Diffie-Hellman key change, the elliptic curve digital signature algorithm. Therefore, it is necessary to design new crypto systems that may be secure from quantum computers. These are called post-quantum crypto systems. The classic Michaelis crypto system from 1978 is based on linear codes and is apparently immune to attacks using the Shor algorithm. Therefore, several PQ crypto systems proposed in this year are actually variations of these schemes, such as LEDACRIT, low density parity check code based, BIKE, Quick flipping key encapsulation, HQC, Hemming Qualicycle, and CFS, Courtois, Pignat, Sendre. A lattice is discrete subject L of ZM, which we see inside RN. The most popular post quantum crypto systems are based on lattices, for example, Entrue, Crystals. Graphic suite for algebraic lattices and SEBA. We don't claim that these are the best, we just state in fact that these are the most popular. There are many algorithms for solving systems of multivariate polynomials over finite fields, in particular. But no efficient algorithm is known, even for quantum computers. So, some crypto systems based on multivariate algebra have been proposed, especially for signature algorithms, the classical Owen Vinegar and the more recent Rainbow and Gems. There are other families of post quantum algorithms which need to be investigated more in depth. These are based on many mathematical problems. For example, isogenous between elliptic curves, properties of hash functions, zero knowledge proofs, and other interactive protocols, and so on. Now we pass to cloud encryption. Nowadays, storing sharing data on the cloud is very common. Cloud operators are expected to manipulate data without being fully trusted. This means that we would like to have our stored data, our shared data encrypted on the cloud, but still with the possibility to control the access to the data and 
search, or even modify encrypted documents without decryption on the server. So cloud encryption is being introduced to address this issue. Actually, cloud encryption is a name for a wide area. We can distinguish at least three main areas. The so-called attribute-based encryption, homomorphic encryption, which itself is divided into full homomorphic encryption, FHG, somewhat homomorphic encryption, partial homomorphic encryption, and then functional encryption, FE. We will have a look at each of these now. We start from full homomorphic encryption. It allows to execute any operation on encrypted data without decryption. What we mean with that, the operation ciphertext correspond to operations on the clear text. So if we apply function f prime to the encryption x and the encryption y, it will be the encryption of a function f applied to x and y. Of course, f and f prime may have to be different depending on the schemes. Weaker than homomorphic encryption than the full part is the somewhat homomorphic encryption. In these schemes, we can perform homomorphically some operations only for a limited number of times. And we can perform addition multiplication, for example. In contrast to that, in partially homomorphic encryption, we don't we can perform an unlimited number of times the same operation. So we can perform only one operation, addition multiplication, for example, but as many times as you want. Functional encryption. Functional encryption is a slightly different concept. So far, we have mentioned schemes that return the encrypted result of some operations on the encrypted data. So encrypted result of operation. A functional encryption scheme, on the contrary, is a specific function of the encrypted document, which is revealed unencrypted. So if, if C is the, encrypt, is the encryption of X, then we can perform a kind of decryption applied to C using a special key, which is called an evaluation key. And the result of this decryption is a function directly of X, of the playtext. And we can do this operation when nothing else is revealed. Searchable encryption. Sometimes we would like to search securely through files that are stored encrypted on the cloud without downloading them. A possible solution is using special encryption method called collectively searchable encryption. Usually in these schemes, the list of possible keywords is known in advance. Now we pass to ABE. Attribute-based encryption associates attributes and access policies to ciphertext and keys. Only if the access policy is satisfied by the set of attributes, the message can be decrypted correctly. And this is a proper property which is inherent in the cryptography. Historically, ABE is an extension identity-based encryption, which we don't detail now. There are two types of ABE, ciphertext policy ABE. The policy is embedded in the ciphertext and the attributes are associated to the keys. In key policy ABE, the roles are swapped. The most common scenario is actually ciphertext policy ABE, since it gives privilege to the file maker. Okay, now it's time to give a brief introduction to complexity theory. 
very brief. We start with decision problems. Let F be the bit field, which in mathematics is called as F2, the field with only two elements, the smallest possible finite field. Now, we are interested in this I, which can be write as zero one star, or we can think of it as the union of all vector spaces over F. What is this? This i is nothing else but the set of all binary string of any finite length. Okay, a decision problem P is a collection of function Fn such that each of these functions is sending n bits to one bit. So we send the vector in Fn to F. This is just a decision problem. Now, an instance of P is any string that we want to assess. So J can be a yes instance if a friend of J is one, where of course N is a number of bits of J. And J is a no instance if N of J is zero. So this map Fn from Fn to F we can think of them as given a vector of bits, we say yes or no. That's why decision problem. Okay. Now, an algorithm that solves P is by definition any algorithm A that is able to compute Fn for any n. So, you want to know if an instance is yes or no, you can apply the algorithm A. Any algorithm that came to that for all n or possible instances is an algorithm that solves P. In this case, we write A solves P. Okay, what is the complexity of decision problem? Is nothing else as the minimum of the complexity of all algorithms that solves P. We use this gamma A to denote the complexity of an algorithm. We don't delve into the description of this. However, just a few notation. If you have an algorithm that solves P, we can consider the worst case complexity, and we can look at just two classes of complexity for the moment. First, poly n. An algorithm is in poly n if the complexity of computing Fn j, so Fn will give an instant j using A, this complexity can be bounded by C n to A, where n is the bit length, and C and A are constant. So if A is in poly n, so we have this relation, for at least the one problem that solves P, then P itself will say it's in P. Okay, polynomial time problem. On the other hand, we could have an algorithm that needs an exponential time. So we say that A is in X n, if every time you use this algorithm to compute a fan J, this can be bounded by C to A n, where n is the bit length and C and A are constant. Okay, if we have, uh, if you have that A source P, and A is in X n, then we say that P is in X. Of course, everything that can be solved in polynomial time could also be solved in, X, in exponential time. So P is included in X. And we can prove, but we don't do it, that there are problems even more than X, but we don't need for our lecture. Let's have a, let's have a look at some problems. MQ problem. Given a system of n quadratic square free polynomials in f of x1, xm. So you can see this. This is a polynomial with some degree two terms, some degree one terms, and possibly degree zero terms. And we have m of them and m variables. Given a system like this, so the a's, the b's, the c's are constant. And we are looking for the x's. Is there any solution for this system? 
the solution V, V1, Vm, a solution in Fm, so not only there is a solution to this system, but if this solution exists, where all components of the solution are themselves bits, zero or one. So it's not, we are not allowed to go in extension field to transition. The solution has to be fine in F2 if there are. Well, so we wonder if such a solution exists, how can we solve this problem? A way to solve this problem is to try all possible vectors with n bits, plug here in the system and see if it's zero, zero, zero or not. If we can solve our equation to have all zeros, then we found the solution. If we tried all possible vectors and we never find all zeros, then a solution does exist. How much does it cost? Well, since all possible vectors are two to the m and the computation here is just polynomial time in m, this problem is obviously in exp. Exponential time we can solve m cube. Okay. Now we need something a bit more complex. What is a verifier? Here in decision problem, we can speak of a verifier as a set of function, a set of function gn, where gn takes two inputs. Okay. One input is a length in bit n, and this corresponds to the instances. Another input has a length m, where this M actually depends on N. What is this mysterious second input? Okay. Let us suppose we have a yes instance J of B. Okay, so we can write GN, GN, J. Now, if this is a yes instance, what we want from the definition of verifier is that there is a second input here that gives one. The second input, that gives one is called a certificate. It will be a vector with m bits. However, if we have a no instance, j, you must be sure that for any second input c, whatever you find, gn here, we always give zero. So informally, a verifier is able to check if you have a assistant, if someone gives him a special number, a special certificate, but it has no way, doesn't mean that there is a certificate for a no instance. Only thing that we know for a no instance is that you can try your possible second inputs and you always have zero. Now, a verifier can be a difficult idea, but think of MQ. So we have a system of polynomials, okay? An instance is just a system polynomial. We are given a binary vector, okay? How can we define the verifier? Right. Given an instance, J, given system polynomial, given a possible solution, you just plug C in J. Gen of JC, just the result of the evaluation. It's either zero or one. In other words, gn of jc is one. If and only if c is solution of j, which can happen, of course, only if j is a yes instance. Only in this case, c is by certificate. Now, if a system has no solution, you can try to substitute in the system all the c that you want, but you'll never find the solution because there is no solution. There is no solution. There is nothing you can do about it. Okay, what is MP? Given the decision problem, we say that P is an MP if P admits a verifier in poly M. So if you have a verifier that can verify in polynomial time, given a certificate, every assistant, there's something in MP. We don't claim anything about the non instances. However, observe that given an instant j, we could try to compute all possible gn jc with all possible c, keeping j fixed. 
in the case of the system, no? imagine try all possible solutions. And then if we find the solution, okay, if we don't find, the solution does exist. If it exists, then C is a valid certificate. Otherwise, there is no valid certificate. In other words, by trying our possible second inputs, we will solve the problem. And so if a problem is an MP, the problem is necessarily also in X. Because with an exponential time, the, by trying our possible vector C, which are exponential in N, we will decide if there is a, if the instance is yes or no. Okay, given two decision problems, we would like to compare them. It's called them P and Q. I will say that uh, there is a reduction from P to Q if there is a map from E to E, to the set of all strings, to the set of all strings, such that any existence of P is sent to the existence of Q, and any no instance of P is sent to a no instance of Q. So yes goes to yes, no goes to no. And of course, we assume that all reductions are poly L. So if you want to verify if something is yes or no in P, you can apply the reduction and you can verify it in Q. Okay. Why is it so interesting? Because there are problems which are NPR. The problem is NPR if for any problem in P, Q, there is a reduction from Q to P. So a problem is NP hard. If any time you have a problem in NP, you don't know well what to do, there is a reduction. So you can take an instance that you don't know Q and you send it to an instance of P. You solve P and you know you have solved also Q. So this problem is very important. The fact that reduction exists doesn't mean that we know how to write them explicitly, they're nice, etc. We know that they exist in many cases. And then uh, a problem is NP complete if P is NP hard, so it can be used to solve a problem NP, and it's itself NP. So the NP complete problem are the most difficult problems inside NP, because if you can solve them, or actually any of them, you can solve all problems in NP. Therefore, in cryptography, we need operations which are fast for the good guys and slow for the bad guys. So this means problems that we can work with them polynomially, but to find solution has to cost exponentially. In other words, we need crypto systems which are based on mathematical problems related to MP problems. Since we want to secure crypto system, we would prefer to have MP complete problem. That would be the ideal. MP complete problems look strange, but they aren't. Actually, MQ is MP. If you take a system quadratic polynomials, where we have n variables and m equations, so we remove the restriction that n has to be equal to m, this is NP complete. This is, if you can solve this, find the solution, this system exists. If you can solve this polynomially, you will be able to solve all polynomials on NP, and cryptography will die tomorrow. Another problem which is NP complete is MLD, which is used in coding theory. Taking a binary matrix H from M, an MN matrix, taking a vector in n bits and choose a positive integer up to n. Now, we wonder if there is a vector in n bits, a weight at the most t, such that h v transpose is equal to s transpose. So we know this, we know this. Of course, v will exist in general, depending on the rank of H, but even the rank of H guarantees that V exists, it's not so obvious that such a V has a weight smaller than a given T. 
And believe it or not, also if you can solve the problem, then you can solve all problems in any field. I hope you enjoyed this course and thanks.